Hello and welcome to the Arms Control Poser Podcast. My name is William Albert, Director of Strategy, Technology and Arms Control at the International Institute for Strategic Studies in Berlin. I will be your host as we explore the world of arms control. On each podcast, I will interview the great and the good of the arms control community about a current event related to a treaty or agreement, past, present, or only proposed. Then together, we will go, hopefully, deep enough on the history and functioning of the agreement to help you make sense of it all. And, well, that's the idea anyway. This podcast is funded by the European Union Non-Proliferation and Disarmament Consortium. Now let's get underway. Welcome to the Arms Control Poser Podcast. William Albert here, and today our special guest on the Arms Control Poser Podcast, Allison Pitlock, the Cyber Program Lead at the Stimson Center in Washington, D.C. Welcome, Allison. Thank you very much for having me. I'm glad to have you here. And today, so the subject of the podcast is going to be cyber threats. That's the that's the issue. That's the problem. And of course, we're going to try to talk about what the ongoing efforts in the international, regional, bilateral, any realm is to try to better control cyber threats. So I can ask you the question just to kick us off. So what do you think are the biggest challenges in terms of maintaining a secure cyberspace? This is a great question. And this is also a very big question, right? Like, you know, often when I talk to people about, you know, say like, oh, I work on cyber or I work on cyberspace issues, um, I think you kind of quickly realize immediately that people view and understand that term in so many different ways. And I think that that sort of points to the fact that it is a very multi-dimensional, multi-sectoral uh, issue area. In cyberspace, which isn't really necessarily a space as such, it's large, it's a complex, it's a pervasive topic and issue area involving a wide, massive range of actors um, and variables. And so the challenges are likewise wide ranging, which I think can sometimes make them feel a little bit overwhelming. So for example, you know, you have your challenges that are really resulting from bad actors, which can be everything from bad state actors, including potentially some of their proxies, non-state actors, which can include organized criminal groups, disorganized criminal groups, individuals who might, you know, be be actual professional hackers or maybe people who are just being nasty to other people online, you know, bullies and trolls and so forth. But then you've also got technological challenges. And I think that some of these actually come from the solutions side, you know, how to get better or more seamless threat intelligence sharing, how to do better and faster attribution forensics after there's been an incident. Two challenges that come from technology that is itself inherently malicious and problematic. So things like spyware, ransomware, and so forth. Um, but you know, then there's also like a basket of challenges, I think, that have to do with sort of governance and policy issues. What are the rules of the road? Do those rules of the road have teeth? Is everyone on board with them? How to build trust and confidence and capacity to implement the rules of the road, especially in an issue area that tends to be, you know, murky and, and sometimes linked with espionage and intelligence gathering. What's acceptable behavior and what is not? And then, of course, there's lots of challenges, too, in terms of the impacts of cyber operations, financial loss, impacts on democracies and electoral integrity critical infrastructure going offline, bullying, gender-based violence, um, how can these be prevented and responded to? And so I think I'm trying to not skirt your question, but maybe just sort of, you know, map out the immensity of the topic at hand, um, but also to make the point that in thinking about cyber challenges and their solutions, it can be helpful and effective to break them down into smaller and maybe more like bite-sized pieces, if you will. Otherwise, I think we risk like overwhelm and inaction right, right. and different challenges are going to require different solutions. It strikes me as well. I mean, when we talk about cyberspace, I mean, we're talking about basically the infrastructure for all, you know, global communications, all electronic actions. It, it's such a, it's such a huge topic. And, you know, it's really hard to differentiate between a threat that is something, uh, you know, more along the lines of, as you said, um, cyberbullying or just pure you know, criminal enterprise activities, things like that, versus actual state threat. I mean, not threats that emanate from states, but threats to states, threats among states. 
the really terrible actions that are at the highest levels, the military to military threats, or the threats to an individual state's military infrastructures. And it strikes me that part of the threat environment is when all of this infrastructure was designed, it wasn't really designed with an idea of how to secure it, and nor was it designed you know, with real purpose or idea towards governance. So it's not immediately apparent how to control those threats uh, because you know a lot of this grew so organically and really without controls. Is that right or, or do I have that wrong? No, no, I think you have that exactly right. And in some cases, I think there are now cyber related threats to pre-existing military operations to 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 weapons infrastructure to to stockpiles to things like this but then there's also sort of new threats that are are just about sort of like cyber so maybe this changes like a little bit year to year right because cyber and and technology is is always evolving and changing but i was thinking a little bit about you know what's what's been maybe some of the biggest threat areas in in 2023 or or recently and i think I think, you know, number one, ransomware. There are different estimates on the scale and financial impact of ransomware right now, depending on who's reporting that you look at. Um, but definitely it's it's up into the, the millions, if not billions of dollars. But what's clear is that no matter where you look, is that ransomware is affecting everyone. It's affecting national governments and countries. It's also affecting institutions businesses, as well as as individuals. And those the solutions and responses to that, I think, need to be targeted to those different sectors and the different uh, victim types. In general, like it's a very multifaceted threat. And then I've got some other thoughts as well on spyware, AI, and the Russia-Ukraine conflict. So, so what, are, there, are there good examples of ransomware against states? Yeah, the attack on Costa Rica. Uh, I can't remember if that was earlier this year or late last year, but I think that's sort of a prime example of where a national government was targeted by a ransomware operation. It was eventually linked to a non-state criminal group, um, but I think the scale of that really brought home the sort of vulnerability of, of national governments. Um, and there's been other operations too, you know, I think um, sort of targeting maybe websites of governments or, um, you know, specific departments, ministries. Um, I'm not sure if there's been on part, I know there's been malware, ransomware, and other forms of operations uh, targeting parliamentary websites, which have been uh, problematic, of course. But yeah, I think the Costa Rica example is probably the best. No, that's, that's a great example. But, uh, but I mean, I suppose the biggest threat then is to like national military command and control, especially nuclear command and control, or control of outer space objects, or, you know, basic interference with command control, intelligence, location, all that kind of spoofing, jamming, all that kind of stuff that can happen in the cyber realm that could either cause a conflict, uh, and, you know, again, that can come from a non-state actor interfering with a government, either at the direction of another government or just completely independently, um, or, you know, spreading a, a false information through cyber information that then causes one side to react a different way. So, I, I mean, it just, it looks like this, the threat environment is just massive and the, 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 the possibilities for mayhem are huge. So I think people have a pretty good grasp on that. So why don't I ask you, how do we manage these threats? You know, and specifically this podcast, we try to look at, are there arms control solutions? Are there non-proliferation solutions? But, you know, we're talking about something relatively intangible. And so it's harder to think about how arms control can connect to this. So, you know, I guess we turn towards rules, principles, behaviors, things like that. So what can you tell me about, you know, as an arms controller, how do you approach cyber threats? How do we, how do we manage these? And, you know, again, breaking them down into the different categories you have, government threats, non-state actor threats, rogue warrior threats. How, how do we approach this from an arms control point of view? Oh, that's uh, also a great question. There's been sort of a um, a long and healthy debate about the applicability of arms control and non-proliferation approaches to uh, cyber operations and international cyber security threats. And so mm. I feel that like 
when you ask, like, can you connect arms control and disarmaments to cyber governance and threats? I always want to say yes and no. Um, and let me, I'll, now I'll tell you why, because I think first on the yes, like to, to your point is that there are some very specific cyber related threat to weapons, to, to sort of military operations or activities. You know, I think it was earlier this month, or maybe it was like in, in late November, the Guardian reported that the UK's most hazardous nuclear site, Sellafield, had been hacked into by cyber groups linked to Russia and China. And this is not a one-off incident. You know, earlier this year, I spoke on a different podcast. Um, organized by Inkstick Media um, for their Things That Go Boom series. And they did a whole episode talking to people about the cyber operations and cyber threats to nuclear facilities, whether it's nuclear weapons facilities or nuclear energy facilities. You know, can you hack a nuclear weapon, I think was a title. So there's, there's sort of like that problem area. Um, and then, you know, I think kind of to some of the points that you were making, this comes up a lot in relation to, to drones or to uh, lethal autonomous weapons, if and right. when they are in fact developed, the potential to interfere with the signals operation. The dark web itself has become, you know, sort of a playground for obtaining illicit materials and illicit weapons. So there's lots of points of connection between arms control, disarmament, non-proliferation weapons issues and cyber. But then uh, sort of on the flip side of that, and this is sort of where the debate really comes in, um, is that a lot of experts posit that there are just too many differences for these fields to have any relevance. Um, you know, I think from an accountability perspective, some would say that the broad success of many arms control and non-proliferation mechanisms and tools for improving transparency and enhancing cooperation makes an arms control or non-proliferation approach appealing or at the very least instructive. But then sort of at the other end of the spectrum, you know, people point out there's definitional challenges. You can't sure. control a cyber weapon because there's no agreement or at least not universal agreement on what a cyber weapon is. There's a central challenge of verification, which again sort of relates to the intangibility of the things that we use in cyber operations, but also because cyber is sort of, you know, traditionally a covert area and states right. don't want to give up how they do these things because right. then it makes them vulnerable. It's different with it with like physical weapons where you can show what you have, you want to show what you have. That's sort of, you know, the idea that underpins traditional deterrence, right? And then sort of following on from that is just, you know, questions and concerns about compliance and enforcement of any sort of cyber arms control agreement. Right. And I mean, that's part of that's part of the difficulty here is one of the reasons you would create a cyber weapon in order to interfere with it, with an adversary's anything would be that it would be relatively clandestine, that attribution would be difficult. They might not even know it's happening. They might attribute it to accidents. You think about you know, the malware used against the Iranian uh, nuclear program over the years. So getting countries to say, even if they were willing to say, oh, I promise I won't do that, there's really no way to verify that they don't have a bank of computers set up with smart people trying to do that. So yeah, so I, I mean, I can see that on the one hand, as you mentioned, using the dark web to acquire or sell weapons, that's one thing that we can and should address. And, and there's more traditional export control means to, to get at intangibles and things like that. But in terms of a country just deciding to commit sabotage against another country, this is something that's been going on for centuries. And the desire to interfere with the communications of another country and, and spread false orders or something like that predates even the computer age. So these become really big challenges. But is there is there a way then maybe you can have agreements among states that certain things should be off limits? I mean, you mentioned messing with command and control at a nuclear power plant, even it, it within a nuclear weapons program. I mean, there, there, there might be some way to limit the kind of behavior that could set off that kind of dangerous incident. Or, or, or has that not been really a topic that's, that's gained much traction in the international sphere? No, no, it has actually. I think that I think that the sort of direction of travel on this is rather than looking at items or, or things to <laughs> control or to stop being proliferated, maybe with the exception, actually, the one exception to this, I would say, is maybe around commercial spyware, because I think that the spyware problem and phenomenon, we've heard a lot about it over the last two years about its use, about who's making it, who's buying it. Great reporting out there on that from Citizen Lab, Amnesty and others. I think there's like very clear efforts there to control the thing 
whereas a lot of the other efforts have focused more on behaviors of states and and you know like to to what you said about putting some things that are just off limits so what the international community has agreed through many years of work at the united nations are a few points that are relevant here so first all un member states uh, have agreed that existing international law applies to state conduct uh, in cyberspace or in the use of information and communications technology, ICTs. And so with that, you know, that sets in place some limits, including international humanitarian law, which has become very important in the context of cyber operations in Ukraine. But they've also agreed to a set of 11 uh, non-binding voluntary norms of, of state behavior. And they're, the norms are kind of a, a mixed bag. Like some of them are norms of restraint, things that you should not do. And then others are sort of uh, more positive things, things that you should do. Like you should, you know, report vulnerabilities. You should uh, support and exchange information. But the restraint ones, and I think this is a great example and response to your question, is, uh, is about critical infrastructure. Um, and that critical infrastructure should be off limits. Now, where things get a little fuzzy is uh, some countries are quite clear. This is what we see as critical infrastructure. This is not critical. Others haven't said that yet you can probably guess what they would be but you know yeah. some things are a little bit ambiguous and that's um that's problematic but what's also being problematic is that operations targeting critical infrastructure happen all the time yeah oh, as we see in the ukraine war but but honestly as we see in every conflict you, you try sometimes to you know coerce your adversary out of the conflict by hitting you know their power grid and, and things like that but, um, but I mean, maybe, you know, committing not to do things that would disproportionately kill civilians, I guess that's where international humanitarian law kicks in. So, you know, a cyber operation in order designed to you know, cause a dam to break and kill tens of thousands would be considered a clear violation of international humanitarian law. But at the same time, we have real world examples of bilateral declarations of restraint, like, for instance, India and Pakistan have an agreement on the non-targeting of, of nuclear facilities, which they've still managed through, you know, through thick and thin, through really bad times. So maybe there can be some purchase mm -hmm. for kinds of rules based um, agreements or declarations. But still, it strikes me as an area where even if states say they're going to comply with this, there's going to be a missing degree of trust. And that therefore is going to kind of set off its own sort of digital arms race. You know, when you know one side's trying to, to do this thing and you want to defend against it, and sometimes the best way to defend against it is to go after their stuff. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. so, how, so how do we manage what looks to be a digital arms race and, you know, all the resulting tensions and potential for a cyber conflict to escalate into the kinetic realm? Uh, yeah, no, that's, that's an important point to raise. And I think it's also important to remember that the majority of cyber operations and whether they're state sponsored or state led, yes, what's happened in with Russia and Ukraine has brought into focus the wartime uh, context of, of cyber operations. But most other things that are happening all the time are happening in context of peace countries that are two countries that are not actually at war with one another. Well, probably somewhere, somewhere other than peace, maybe. Okay, peace. Yeah, peace. In rivalry and competition. Kinetic operations. Yes, right. yes, yeah. exactly. But and, but it is an important distinction in terms of what kinds of international law apply. And actually, that kind of goes on to, to another really good point is that I think what is also helpful is to not, you know, we hear in the news all the time, like, oh, this cyber incident happened and it has this kind of like, cool name attached to it. A lot of these incidents are, they're not isolated, right? They're part of a broader operation. There's a lot of thinking that we have to better understand cyber operations is along this sort of continuum and that states are kind of constantly probing and poking each other in ways, you know, to, to get at information, to just poke them just to be a little bit annoying because maybe they're right. they're not quite enemies, they're frenemies, you know, uh, this kind of a thing. No. So that's sort of the mode of, or the majority of cyber operations. Yeah, that's such an interesting point because one thing that a colleague of mine, Fabian Hoffman and I were trying to draw out is where cyber fits into what we would call non-nuclear strategic weapons. So yes, you can use it just to poke a country, you can use it just for sabotage, you can use it just for spying. 
but you might also look to cyber to provide you with that strategic effect, something that can completely cripple or paralyze your adversary so that you can avoid the actual kinetic, the messy kinetic stage of conflict, but actually skip to defeating a foe. So for instance, when Russia tried to take down Estonia's entire banking system, that would be an effort to use cyber as a strategic weapon, but not a kinetic weapon, if you know what I mean. Exactly. And that's sort of like always operating under that threshold of poking and prodding and being disruptive and being annoying, but not quite taking it to the point where you think the other country is going to respond with a kinetic attack. And it's this like just under the threshold line where I think most states are playing all the time. Just under Article 51 of the UN. Yes, yes, exactly. Just under that. Article 5 of NATO, that kind of thing. Yeah, and that, but that's what makes things like this, this, the norms so important because they are meant to be there sort of like for peacetime right. behavior, I some guidance. So. Yeah. I think things like the norms need to be sort of operationalized and actualized through agreements and activities. Like you mentioned, the agreement between India and Pakistan, I think they need to be sort of given effect by more tangible agreements, whether they're bilateral, regional, or national policy, national interpretation, and sort of, I, I keep, I've been saying this word a lot lately, but other people are too, so hopefully I'm on the right track, like a, a toolbox right. kind of approach, which is not really dissimilar to arms control either. Arms control isn't one treaty, it's a whole regime, oh, uh, if that no, word is acceptable, yeah. No, I think that's a really important thing to say, because it is one of the things I struggle with when people talk about arms control and they're like, oh my God, arms control is dead. And it's like, well, no, arms control includes export controls. It includes sanctions. It includes risk reduction measures like INCSI agreements and all the rules and norms and behavior agreements that we have throughout the world, bilaterally, regionally, and globally. And that's never really going to go away. So to, to say that, well, because we don't have a treaty that says legally binding, you have to do this and you can't do that. And there's verification just because that doesn't exist in cyber domain doesn't mean that there aren't actual real proposals or actually real agreements that don't exist right now and aren't working in the international system. And again, because I'm that kind of person, I wonder if you can tell me what are the big proposals? Are there existing agreements that are kind of working right now? Are there proposals that that appear to be going somewhere that, that are showing some real promise? What kind of things are you seeing either in the global UN basket or in regional baskets or in bilateral baskets that appears to be the most promising in terms of controlling cyber behavior, and, uh, as you mentioned, escalation from cyber to kinetic conflict? I think there's a lot going on and there is sometimes a little bit of a risk of maybe the left hand not always talking to the right hand with some of this Mm -hmm. stuff. So maybe (laughs) just to start sort of like at the really multilateral, the UN level, as I mentioned, you know, there, there has been this process over very many years now, two decades, through which these different groups of governmental experts, GGEs, They came to the consensus decision about international law applying to state behavior. They articulated the norms of responsible state behavior in cyberspace. Uh, The GGEs, I doubt that there will be further ones. There's now something instead called an open-ended working group, an (laughs) OEWG. And there have been two of those. The first was 2019 to 2021. The current one is in session now until 2025. And so there, all UN member states are working together, or or it's open to all UN member states, as well as to non-governmental stakeholders, although that's been challenging for some of us. And in the OEWG, states are talking about threats. They're talking about how they are operationalizing and understanding the norms, as well as rules and principles. They talk about international law, confidence building measures, capacity building, and sort of the future of UN discussions on this topic. I think it's been a very good venue. Well, first, because it's the big tent, right? Like really everyone is there. And and so you have this kind of wonderful cross-regional exchange of, you know, what we're doing, what we see as priority, and so on and so forth. Where it gets challenging, however, is is taking decisions because of the consensus rule. And I think where that group is sort of coming maybe to to loggerheads or will come to loggerheads is on the on the way forward. The Russian Federation has for many years wanted to establish a new cyber treaty. There are some countries that support it, but not very many. I think other states might like the notion of a treaty or a legally binding instrument, but maybe aren't so keen on what Russia's put on the table. But the sort of new big proposal that has more weight behind it or more support behind it is to create a politically binding instrument, a program of action. Mm 
um, on responsible state behavior in cyberspace. And this is, I think, inspired in part by the program of action on small arms and light weapons. Right. Um, although I think there's there's lots we can learn from that POA, like for better or for worse, about how to go forward on a cyber POA. Right. Um, but that was just recently endorsed through a GA resolution at this past session. That's the UN General Assembly? The UN General Assembly, yes. And it looks like it will need to be sort of negotiated and adopted no later than 2026 when the current OEWG wraps up. But I think it's important also to talk about what's happening at regional levels. That's a good place to take a break. We're going to be right back. You're listening to William Alberg on the Arms Control Poser podcast. So on this UN work, I mean, the Open Ed Working Group, I've been following the Outer Space Open Ed Working Group really, really closely. And this sounds hauntingly familiar, where the Russians come up with a an arms control proposal that many countries believe is just a trap because the way it's worded, it leaves the definitions very vague. It's very difficult to understand how it would be implemented. And many people believe that Russia is trying to circumvent it in terms of their own weapons development and testing. So that has really lacked credibility. Um, and I wonder if that's the same in the space realm. And I also wonder what what's the position of China in the UN? Because on outer space, they've aligned themselves very closely with the Russian position. Is that the same with cyberspace or has China had a different or more nuanced position? I think, um, you know, it's been interesting to watch the sort of developments on outer space governance from the cyber, from the cyber community, because I think, um, We've sort of been looking to outer space as like, you know, you guys have maybe figured out some things about this other domain that's also sort of a, a global commons. And we here in cyber are falling behind. And then I talk to outer space people and they're like, actually, no, you cyber people have it all figured out. <laughs> I mean, there is absolutely like cyberspace, outer space at a technological level are so integrated and that that's like not going to change. But at a governance level, I think we need to do a little bit more, you know, on China. They, at least from the meetings that I've been in, and and I certainly haven't been in every meeting, but from what I see, I don't think that they are super close to the Russian position. I think they like to be a little bit strategically ambiguous. So they might say things, you know, that are generally supportive of legal instruments for this, for, you know, for for an example, but maybe not, you know, voice support for Russia's uh, specific uh, concept. No, I don't think that they've endorsed it uh, as a co-sponsor. For them, they talk a lot about data security. Data security is sort of their primary priority issue that they try to, you know, see reflected in different outcome documents. They've been coming to the first committee with the sort of proposals on this. Also on peaceful uses of technology is also something that they've been championing at the UN. But I think they leave a little bit of space with Russia. But another related issue we, we touched on earlier was attribution. How do you handle attribution in the international sphere? Attribution is a really important part of the conversation about accountability because we can say, yes, we have international law, we have sometimes national law, we have norms, but if everybody is still, you know, violating them or at least undermining them, what what are the sort of the tools do we have to pose a consequence for that irresponsible behavior? And attribution, you know, as part of naming and shaming is sort of one of the go-to things for this. And there's different attitudes. Different countries have different feelings about making attribution statements. Countries have different views on uh, the value and impact of attribution statements, as well as different, um, you know, processes for doing them. It can also be good to keep in mind that attribution is technical, legal, and political. Making the political statement is, um, yeah, one of the big sort of naming and shaming tools. And it's something that the United States does often. It's uh, something that the EU countries are doing more often. Canada, some countries kind of go it alone. Others like to do them sort of as group statements. You can ask questions about how they had impact. I think attribution, making political attribution statements is an important part of the conversation about accountability because it does call things out. And even if there's maybe not a penalty or a consequence, it sort of reinforces the fact that certain types of behaviors are unacceptable, that they cause harm. It would be, 
I think, strengthened if when states make attribution statements, if they could refer to international law, refer to a norm or, or a behavior that makes it a little bit more precise and more linked up to that UN framework. But I think that we're seeing a lot of that happening as well. So we've talked about attribution. We talked about the UN efforts. Is there anything below the level of the United Nations that's happening on cyber rules, norms, governance that, that you think is significant? I think definitely there's, um, in regional groupings, there's a lot of good work happening. And sometimes this is, and then I think particularly the European Union, of course, ASEAN, the OAS as well, although maybe I think their efforts are a little bit more around technical cooperation, maybe than sort of like political cooperation. You also have, of course, also within Europe, the OSCE and the CBMs that they've developed over time. But different, yeah, different regions have different approaches on on this. I think there is definitely good examples of information sharing between national certs and threat intelligence sharing or coordination and effort incident response. Can you tell me what a national cert is? Yeah, Computer Emergency Response Team. Oh, excellent. And I think there's also examples as well, like the European Union recently established an EU diplomacy, I think it's called Diplomacy Toolbox, mm-hmm. which sort of outlines the different range of like measures that they will, um, you know, employ in their diplomacy on on cybersecurity issues. Cyber diplomacy as a field is also just kind of growing into its own and sort of being recognized as sort of an interesting subset of other types of diplomacy or pre-existing diplomacy. So if you had to look into your toolbox and say, what is the whole realm of controls and rules and norms and behaviors and arms control in cyber in 10 years? What do you think? I mean, understanding that, of course, technology will have changed by then and we can never really predict the future. But just based on what you see happening in the different UN and regional processes, what do you think it's going to look like in this in this particular realm of the arms control realm? Yeah, I, I think it's probably going to continue to be a bit of a patchwork approach. I, I don't feel that there is political appetite to do sort of these big global binding treaties and agreements that we see. I don't think if there's appetite for these sort of big global, you know, binding treaties that we have maybe on weapons issues necessarily, at least that would sort of bring together the entirety of the international community. So I think things like regional efforts and initiatives, the program of action, if that comes into being more crisp understanding of international law and how states are interpreting international law to apply to their national behavior. We do need something to do about this accountability gap, like when there we like repercussions for unacceptable behavior. Everyone's sort of dancing around this. Um, I'm not really sure what the answer is. No, I mean, that makes sense. Look, you know, um, whether it's uh, on the high seas or in the air or in outer space, you know, ultimately, there are no real consequences. People are not likely to join into a treaty where they're penalized and, you know, countries where they're habitually penalized for doing things tend to withdraw from those kinds of arrangements. So, uh, you know, aside from being willing to name and shame and you know, try to create a, a bigger group, a bigger community of nations that act within the rules and make it clear that you have you know, an opportunity to work within those rules or, or be one of those countries outside those rules, ultimately, a, a carrot and a stick there's not really much you can do, but it does sound a little optimistic that there is some momentum in these arrangements to actually come up with real rules and norms, rules of the road. And even again, if there's not going to be enforcement, at least to understand who is in, who is abiding by the rules and who's not. This is exactly what we're researching at the Stimson Center right now in the project on cyber accountability is what can we learn from accountability mechanisms in non-cyber issue areas, arms control, disarmament, but also outer space, environment, human rights, peer review mechanisms, things like this. Can they sort of be instructive to efforts in, in cyber governance? Maybe something that I didn't really mention a lot too, but or I didn't mention yet, but I think that is also important, um, you know, are some of the initiatives like the counter ransomware initiative that the United States has launched. I think there are now up to maybe around 50 states who support that. So I think like-minded coalitions of, of states working together is going to be important. There is also a cyber crime treaty, an international cyber crime treaty that's reaching well, what might be its final uh, negotiation conference in January 2024. I don't know if states will take it or leave it or if they'll need more talks on this, but that would be sort of the first truly global cybercrime treaty. There's the Budapest Convention, 
which is it's not that it's not global, but it, I think its membership is a little bit more limited to, to European countries. So this was an effort to sort of bring along other parts of the world. Interestingly, that started as a Russia-led process as well that I think most governments or many governments felt was not needed because of the Budapest Convention. But now that they've all kind of dug in and gotten involved on it, it's become this long draft treaty. We'll see what happens. I think there's good stuff in there, but there's also things that are worrying, including for human rights. And if we could end- and on one last question, this is something that you mentioned, and I, I didn't want to let it go before we signed off. And that is, you said there were some challenges for NGOs or for civil society to engage in this process. And, and I want to ask you exactly what you mean. And, and let me just pause it before you answer. The thing that we're seeing in some other domains as countries like Russia trying to shut civil society out of nuclear dialogue, for instance, the NPT context, is it similar to that or is it something else entirely? No, it's, it's kind of exactly like that. <laughs> and this is maybe unique to the UN Open-Ended Working Group. I don't think that other uh, multilateral fora like the Internet Governance Forum, the cybercrime treaty negotiations have actually been quite good for non-governmental stakeholder involvement. But the OEWG, it's been challenging since day one. And maybe for context for your listeners, in my, in my past life working with WILP and Reaching Critical Will, I was the NGO coordinator for the NPT, PrepComs and RevCons, and at first committees, I bring this perspective with me. But effectively, the non-objection basis rules around which civil society organizations can apply to go to UN conferences have been abused in the case of the open-ended working group. And that once all it takes is one state to say, no, we don't want them here. And that is their prerogative as a member state. But what we've asked is, well, then can they give some reason for doing so? Because you're seeing Microsoft, you're seeing like organizations who have a, a demonstrable track record of work in this field being turned away. And this actually, it it became, I don't want to go on too long about this, but it it became a very prolonged source of conflict and debate at the start of the second OEWG when it commenced its, its talks in 2021. And it actually held up the commencement of the substantive debates because other governments said, this is unacceptable. Right. We are not going to keep letting this happen. And it was sort of an interesting, uh, I don't call it a sideshow, but it was like an interesting uh, <laughs> dynamic in, in that meeting process. Thank you. I appreciate that answer. And I'm glad you raised it because, like I said, it's something that I noticed in the NPT process. It's something we're starting to see in the outer space process. And so it's always good to share information like this across domains because, you know, for some cyber folks who may have never seen these other realms, they don't realize that the same kinds of things are happening. So no, I, I, I do think we don't need to overemphasize it, but still it's notable that it's occurring in places. I, I mean, I think with that, we can leave it there. Thank you very much, Allison. I feel oh, slightly welcome. smarter, but still, wow, so much <laughs> for me to learn in this domain. And I really want to thank you for guiding us through some really complex topics today. No, no. Thank you for having me. It's been a wonderful conversation. I thought you your questions kind of got to the heart of the matter in a lot of places. So thank you. All right. Well, that wraps it up for part one. When we come back in a few minutes with part two, we'll talk about the life and times of Allison. And we're back for part two of the podcast with Allison Pitlock. And this is where I ask Allison about how she got into this field, her life and times and things like that. So let me start with the first question. Allison, so have you always been curious about cyber warfare and cyber governance? Is this something that you were aware of from a relatively young age? Or is this something that you came to through school, through study, or even later through work? I think it is something that I've been interested in for a long time. Maybe it was like, my childhood desire. Well, I really love like spy novels and this kind oh, of okay. thing, which isn't necessarily cyber, but we didn't have no, sure. cyber when I was a child, right? So, um, right, right, right. Yeah, but no, I, I sort of actually during my undergrad at the University of Toronto, I took a course on the history of modern espionage. And in the course of that, I wrote a paper about economic espionage. 
And that wasn't, I wouldn't say specific to cyber, but it was around the time in the early 2000s where digital technologies, cyber intrusions were maybe becoming more prevalent in economic espionage and industrial theft. And I think that that probably seeded a few things in my mind. But then I went on to work more in uh, disarmament, uh, first with the International Campaign to Ban Landmines, and then with the um, with an interfaith organization in New York, actually doing some programming for them on cluster munitions, small arms and light weapons, and then later on the arms trade treaty with the Control Arms Coalition. <laughs> but I kind of got back into cyber or really into cyber well, yeah, when I was working with Control Arms and living in New York, I was doing my master's at CUNY at the City University of New York, and I wrote my thesis on cyber. And my thesis was about, you know, why are some states more likely to use, I'm saying air quotes here, cyber weapons than others. And I, I built out a, a data set to try to examine what are some trends in the countries that are using cyber and countries that are not, and was fortunate in that some of that research was published. And I, I made some excellent contacts in the field that sort of then maybe facilitated a lot of where I've, what I'm doing now. Oh, that's fantastic. Well, all right. So let's go back a little bit. You, so you're at the University of Toronto. What were you studying? What was your main course of study? International relations. Okay. And so then espionage, and then you got really interested in small arms like weapons, cluster munitions, landmines, things like that, and went to New York. Was there a specific job that you applied to while you were at college? Like, How did you get that first job in New York in this field? Well, actually, it was it was really hard. And this is, you know, I finished my undergrad in, in 2004. And I think at the time, IR degrees, there's lots of schools offering them now. But at the time, it was sort of a, an emerging field. And I felt that while many things about U of T were wonderful, I think maybe helping undergrads get that stepping stone into this sort of ambiguous area of work. <laughs> it was it was hard and I did some trial and error for a couple of years. What did happen though is I was put into contact with a Canadian NGO called Mines Action Canada. They are the Canadian partner of the international campaign to ban landmines. <laughs> And I, I liked the work that they were doing to raise awareness about the Ottawa Convention, about victims and survivors of mine and explosive incidents. And I just started volunteering with them. I felt like okay. what they were doing was very relevant to what I'd studied. I got into an internship at the ICBL headquarters in Geneva, which was my first time working with a big international advocacy coalition and, you know, going into the UN and having meetings with delegates and then meeting civil society from around the world. And I just, I think something really turned on for me in all of that. And then the work that took me to New York was was actually, it was, it was an unrelated job move, but then I ended up landing <laughs> oh. with, with uh, this interfaith group. And at the time when the treaty banning cluster munitions was being negotiated. So I was able to sort of draw on the experience of landmines and ICBL to help this particular organization uh, get more engaged in the, the cluster ban process. Wow. Okay. And again, so specifically in terms of jobs, how did you pivot you said you, you did some publishing, you were lucky enough to publish, but how did you pivot in terms of your actual job? Was there, was it, you know, did Stimson grab you or, or was there another organization that you went to from the Interfaith Group in New York to your next job? From the Interfaith Group, I went on to work for the Secretariat of the Control Arms Coalition around the time the Arms Trade Treaty was being negotiated. And mm -hmm. I think that was sort of a bit of a function of having been in New York for a bit, understanding the New York UN and negotiating environments. I hadn't done a ton of work necessarily on international arms trade issues, but I sort of understood the the politics of things. And that was also a wonderful experience, you know, very interesting to watch that treaty be negotiated. Again, wonderful to work in an international coalition. And then from there, <laughs> I went on to, to a different job with the Women's International League for Peace and Freedom, where I was at for the last six years. And WILP has, you know, this fantastic long running disarmament program reaching critical will. Maybe some of your listeners are familiar with it. Right. Um, and it was in that role where we did lots of different disarmament files that I slowly began to integrate cyber stuff. And, and they were quite open to, you know, finding ways for me to, if I, you know, in, if when the time and resourcing allowed, of course, to, um, you know, start doing some writing about 
gendered implications of cyber operations, feminist perspectives on militarization of cyberspace. This is around the time the open-ended working groups were kicking off, and I was like there already monitoring the first committee. So I started this thing called the, the Cyber Peace and Security Monitor, which is one of RCW's monitors of, of processes and was like very integrally involved in the open-ended working group. But you know, I think like anything, you at some point need some change, and the opportunity Stimson came up last year. I like that they're looking into accountability in particular. I think it's something I've always been interested in. And so I just, I made that jump over to uh, to Stimson earlier this year. Right. But, you know, one of the things I'm trying to clarify for people is, you know, when we'll say make that jump, there was a job online or somebody talked to you about like how, how specific, what did the mechanics of that look like? Because, you know, some people, especially for younger folks, the processes of how you actually get the next job is really kind of confusing, terrifying. So how did you how did you make that leap? That seems like a great leap at a, at a great organization, Simpson. But how did that happen? So I had a, a non-resident fellowship with Stimson for a little while, simply because I knew some people there and they were wanting, I think, to get a cyber program underway. They didn't have one yet. And they were, you know, just kind of thinking of people that they know who know something about cyber. And I was one of them. So I was just kind of, you know, as a helping them a little bit with their accountability webinar series and, and then some other things. And then it, it seems that, you know, this position kind of opened up. So I see. I, yeah. Applied to it, and, and that's it. So, so it really was because you had published on the topic, and they had invited you to some workshops or something. At Stimson. No, no. Um, pre- the the way the Stimson folks found you, the way that that they were working with you, was it because you had published something, and they saw it, and they thought that was good. No, actually, I, I knew people there from their work on the arms trade treaty. Um, ah, and okay. I don't know if you're familiar with the forum on the arms trade uh, yeah. that that Jeff Abramson. Yeah, so I think yeah. Stimson's got some people in in the forum. I'm in the forum, so I think it's. I think this is a. I guess maybe what I would sort of offer listeners is that I think these are sort of somewhat niche fields of work, and I think that there is a lot of value in in getting to know people and keeping up with contacts and taking opportunities. You know, go to events, listen to events, like have coffee meetings with people. Like I think a lot of things are relationship based um, in part because I think there's a lot of trust that also goes into this work. These are sensitive topics. And I think it's people want to work with people that they know can maybe understand the political environments in which we're working. Yeah. So I I think, I think my sort of takeaway that I always encourage people who are starting out in the field is yeah, get out there and meet people and network and it's a little scary and it's a little intimidating, but I think we're maybe a bit of a, of a wonky community, but we're all really nice people. <laughs> uh, yeah, uh, mostly, mostly. Um, no, I think that is absolutely fantastic advice and, and advice that I always give younger folks. But now let me flip that on you a little bit and ask the final question here for today, which is if you could go back into your career or your life at any point and give yourself some advice that would have helped you along that maybe would have alleviated some stress or, or clarified things for you or helped you in your career, what would that advice be? And when, and when would you have needed that advice the most? I have some specific things that maybe I wish I had studied. Like recently I've been thinking, I really wish I went to law school. <laughs> um, <laughs> but um, that's that's maybe different than, than what you're asking. I honestly, I would say to people, don't hesitate and don't be afraid to ask questions. I'm an inherently shy and kind of quiet person. And I've had to work to overcome that, you know, to to give talks, to go into meetings, to do a podcast, right? But I can think back to many instances in my career, and I still do it now, where I have a question or I have something to say, but I don't put up my hand because I'm I'm nervous, I'm going to sound stupid, or like I'm supposed to already know the answer to it, and I don't, and I hesitate. And inevitably, every time you do, someone else says, oh, I'm really glad that you asked that question. So I've been working on this myself now for a while, and I think, you know, for anyone listening of any age, really, or you know, background, like is, is to not hesitate and, and to not be afraid that you're asking a silly question. That is amazing advice. I really appreciate that because I had a crippling fear of public speaking until I was 42. Just could not do it. I absolutely could not do it. I was incapable every time in a room full of eight people or maybe 10 or more, uh, someone would ask me a question and just sweat would start visibly pouring out of my forehead. And it's, it, and I can't tell you how many times I've been at a conference or workshop and thought, well, uh, no, probably everyone knows that, or I'm going to sound dumb or whatever. 
and I didn't do it and I regretted it afterwards. And yet the times that I actually did do it, just as you said, people will come up and say, oh my God, I'm so glad you asked that. I was so lost or I was thinking of the same thing or yeah, no, to, to have the courage of that, yeah. to have the courage to raise your hand and potentially make a mistake, but hopefully to clarify things is something that I think everyone should have. I, I also just maybe want to just end on this too. Is like, I think it's especially important for women and for younger women to not hesitate. I, I've, you know, over the course of my career, I've done a lot of studies of, of, of gender dynamics especially in international security issues. And we are underrepresented. And it's important too that it's not just women writ large, but women coming from global south, women coming from different backgrounds, you know, different levels of ability that we don't let that hold us back. And we we know we, t- we raise our hands, we ask our questions, we make our presence felt. That is absolutely a fantastic place to leave things. Alison, like, thank you so much for being here today. Thank you for talking to me. And really, thank you for sharing about yourself and your life. I do really help that this part two helps people, you know, helps demystify some of the things in these careers uh, and show younger folks, especially. There's no one way to be a significant figure in the field as you are And I'm so grateful to have had you on the podcast today. Thank you, Allison. Thank you. All right. That's all we have time for today for the Arms Control Poser podcast. My thanks once again for being here, for sharing her wisdom with us. Thanks also to the EU Nonproliferation Discernment Consortium for funding this podcast. Thank you to B. Aubrey Freeman, as always, for the amazing music. See you next time. again.